Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Sazi. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Washington and co-founder and CEO at OctoML. It's really great to have an opportunity to uh, give a talk at SNIA STC uh, again. So it turns out that I gave a talk here with Karen Strauss five years ago on the name data storage. And it's just so great to see how much has happened since then and how much excitement there is in this new field. It's great to see a fantastic uh, session here full of uh, great results. So um, I'm we're going to tag team. I just introduced myself. Now I'm going to pass the token to Kari and I'll come back uh, halfway to the talk. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Strauss, a Senior Principal Research Manager at Microsoft Research. And it's really, as Luis mentioned, a pleasure to uh, come back to uh, SNIA SDC and uh, talk about the, the progress uh, in the area. Uh, for five years, we've been uh, working on DNA data storage. There are other companies now who have uh, joined uh, this area, and you're going to hear from, from them later on. And we've also uh, created the DNA Data Storage Alliance to, to push the, the, the field forward. So um, let's uh, dig into it. Uh, today, what I'm going to do is give you an overview of DNA Data Storage and uh, uh, sort of provide a little bit of context of the talks that you're uh, about to hear uh, later in the presentation. And Luis will cover some of the trends and also some of the work that we've been doing uh, during these five years. All right, so um, this is a collaboration, as you can uh, probably gather by now, between Microsoft and University of Washington, and together we created the Molecular Information Systems Lab to work on uh, the chemistry, biology, innovation uh, to, uh, to uh, help with issues in uh, the IT industry. Um, so DNA Data Storage is our, our flagship uh, project, and... Um, Sorry about the technical issues here. So it's our, our flagship project. And uh, so just uh, this uh, for this audience, I don't need to say much about uh, storage capacity uh, issues and how the data we generate has been growing a lot faster uh, than the data we create. Uh, you, this audience should be very familiar with the chart that I have here on the left. Um, but really, there's a, there's a gap in what we generate and our ability to store information. And that gap is growing if we simply follow it follow the trend. Um, so uh, what, what this results in is that the percentage of the, all the data that we generate uh, is shrinking over time. Um, so uh, we, we think that uh, there should be different ways. Uh, we need different ways to store information and DNA data storage provides a different way to do that. Um, so here's the, the rationale now and, and uh, how it's different uh, from what it, what's been done before. Um, so the Industry, um, storage industry and semiconductor industry in general has um, evolved by following uh, Moore's law. And so essentially increasing the number of transistors or the number of cells that you have to store information um, over time and packing more uh, on the same area. Uh, and with that, getting gains in capacity and gains in costs. Now, I want to contrast this approach with an approach that was uh, proposed in the 60s uh, by, uh, in the 50s actually, uh, by Richard Feynman, where he pointed out that if we have the ability to arrange atoms in the way we want, we may be able to get to uh, molecular computing, molecular storage. And, and this is what we're uh, trying to do with DNA data storage. He even used DNA as a molecule, as an example of molecule that can store information. Um, he stopped short of proposing uh, to use that for, to use that to store digital information, but that didn't take very long. You know, the people in the 60s proposed that. And with the uh, increased uh, uh, technological progress in uh, biotechnology, now we have the tools to really realize, uh, realize on that vision. Um, so that this sort of era of DNA data storage started in about uh, 2012, 2013, when folks uh, observed that it's possible to, uh, now the tools make it possible for us to, to store uh, and retrieve digital data from DNA. So what's, what's DNA data storage? DNA, um, if we think of DNA as a material, DNA is that double helix, right? And each side of the double helix uh, is a sequence of bases, A, T, C, and G. 
right? And these bases, today we have the, the, the tools to arrange these bases in arbitrary sequences so that if we have a sequence of bits that we want to store, we can store that sequence of bits by translating, by doing a mapping between the bits and a sequence of bases. Um, so for example, you could use the simple mapping that I'm uh, showing here, or you could, could use a completely different, uh, different mapping. In fact, we, we use more sophisticated uh, codes to do that translation, but bottom line, translate a sequence of bits into a, sequences, a sequence of, of uh, bases. Now I talked about the double helix, and uh, what I mean by that, the, the, the information in the uh, double helix is redundant. And what I mean by that is that if you have a particular sequence on one side of the double helix, um, if you remember from biology uh, classes, A complements T, and that's uh, the, the, if the A is on one side of the double helix, the T is on the other side. If a C is on one side, the G is on the other side. And, and uh, so there's complementarity there. But from an information storage uh, uh, point of view, uh, that's sort of redundant information. So we typically think of the DNA as one side of the double helix, and this is what's drawn here. Now, uh, as I uh, mentioned, now we have tools to write and read the DNA in the arbitrary ways. And so, um, we have uh, technology to make synthetic DNA, and this is what I'm going to be talking about uh, during this, this presentation and probably uh, throughout the track, we're all talking about synthetic DNA as a way to store information. Um, and so to point out that this is the material, but there's no cells, there's no organisms, no life involved here, it's really the, the, the material uh, used to store the information. Um, so why do we want to store digital information in synthetic DNA? Uh, first is density. So here's a test tube. This is sort of an expanded uh, picture of that test tube. And what you see at the bottom of that test tube, uh, that pink smear is uh, dried DNA. And that's enough DNA to store, enough physical DNA to store the equivalent of 10 terabytes. So, you know, a pretty uh, reasonable uh, hard drive. Uh, and uh, you can store all that in the bottom of the test tube. So density is quite, uh, quite, uh, quite high uh, for DNA. Um, and if you extrapolate that into uh, to, um, uh, what this means data center wide is uh, what today we need a building to house, uh, tomorrow you'd need essentially a very small, uh, very small space. Um, and this is really, uh, sort of proportionally what you'd need. Um, so it's really probably just a pixel in your screen. Um, so very high density. In real size, uh, that's about one uh, cubic inch uh, that can house about one, one exabyte of, of data uh, in it. So quite, quite dense. So density is certainly one property that we like about DNA. The other is durability. Um, so DNA can be encapsulated. Uh, there, there are uh, even demonstrations in the wild that DNA that can preserve its information for uh, thousands of years, even a uh, million years. Um, but uh, obviously that's under very special conditions, but it turns out that those conditions can be reproduced synthetically and we can store um, DNA um, for quite a long time without having the information in it uh, degrade. And the extreme density of DNA also helps because if you need to, uh, for example, create some conditions like cooling it, um, it's very dense and so it's pretty easy to cool uh, quite a lot of material and therefore quite a lot of uh, data. Um, so that begs the question, how does it compare with other types of media? So here we're plotting both density and the durability lifetime of different media. And so you can see that um, DNA, uh, you know, projections and at the limit, it's, it's many orders of magnitude better than the best uh, types of technologies we have. Uh, but even uh, once we discount everything that we need, that we think we need to uh, build a practical system, um, so uh, overheads from air correction, metadata, the containers that hold the DNA themselves, even if we discount that, we still have a few orders of magnitude higher density. And also, you know, uh, thousands of years, uh, sort of a conservative um, uh, prediction here um, can uh, really, it, it's, it's, it's actually pretty good from, from a preservation uh, point of view. So uh, next is relevance. So um, now that we know how to read DNA and we use it to read our genomic DNA, um, we always have readers to recover the information that we store, the digital information that we store in, in uh, synthetic DNA. 
And so we can essentially ride uh, all the improvements that we've been that the, the biotechnology uh, industry has been making uh, to um, uh, to essentially our benefit. And uh, what's interesting about DNA is that the medium uh, doesn't change. So as we improve the technology, we don't need to migrate to the next uh, generation of media. Um, so that, that actually makes it even more relevant and, and reduces some of the, the headaches uh, that we typically have in, in doing migration. And finally, um, one other property, nice property of DNA is the ability to make copies. Um, uh, so essentially there's this uh, reaction that you may have heard uh, due to COVID times, uh, polymerase chain reactions, where you can use it to, to copy the DNA and copy it in bulk so that you, you end up with uh, many copies of the same uh, of the same sequence. And so, um, you know, for making multiple copies and for example, data distribution, uh, this could be quite interesting. Um, and finally, recently we did a study on environmental sustainability. That's uh, uh, very much uh, uh, a topic that's that's front and center these days with um, uh, climate change. And what we did was compare DNA or what the system, if we deploy DNA at large scale, would look like, and what it, uh, how it compares to a tape system uh, where. Uh, in terms of the carbon emissions and the energy consumption and the water consumption um, to store one terabyte for a year. So that was sort of our, our unit. And what, um, what this, um, re, uh, this, this uh, pre-screening screening, um, life cycle assessment has shown is that uh, along these axes, uh, DNA is actually quite promising. Um, so we're very excited about that uh, as well. So DNA could provide a more sustainable way to store digital information. All right, so I'll, I'm going to cover uh, quickly uh, what we, uh, you know, our view of what the DNA data storage system uh, should look like. Um, and uh, and you're going to hear a lot more in this track. You're going to hear a lot more from other companies working on different parts of this uh, of this pipeline, this system here. So we start with bits. Um, and as I mentioned, we can encode into sequences of those bases, right? And that's still an electronic representation. And then it's time to make the molecules. That's the process of synthesis, which is a right process. Um, next, we preserve the DNA to ensure that um, create the conditions for the, the information to be preserved into the DNA. When it's time to read, we'll perform random access um, and uh, recover the molecules that we're interested in reading. We'll sequence them, uh, which is the process of reading them, and we'll decode them and then uh, recover the bits that we had originally stored. So let me show you uh, how uh, this is done in a little bit more detail. But before I do that, I just wanted to comment on uh, some of the results so far. So we've been working, again, Microsoft University of Washington, and uh, for this particular uh, work, we collaborated uh, with uh, Twist Bioscience. Uh, we encoded one gigabyte of data in DNA. Twist uh, has synthesized uh, that um, uh, that into into DNA, and we were able to recover. And we wanted to make a point that uh, it's format independent, and so we uh, selected uh, different formats uh, to encode in DNA, all the way from uh, text um, to high definition video to uh, high quality audio, uh, archival quality audio. Um, so we've encoded a number of uh, files, and then we were able to, to recover using this end-to-end this -end system that, that I was talking about. Um, so again, I'm going to walk you through um, what the system looks like. So uh, let's take this OKGO OK video that we've encoded uh, in DNA. So it's 44 megabytes of information. Uh, first step was to partition it into smaller segments of uh, different sequences of bits that we wanted to store and number them like we used to number uh, floppies just so that we can reorder the information on the way out. We add some redundancy for error correction, and then we translate those bases, um, those bits into bases of DNA. We add uh, an additional tag that's sort of a file ID and also allows us to uh, more easily copy the information. And then uh, those sequences go into uh, the writing process. So that's DNA synthesis. Uh, DNA synthesis is essentially um, a parallel process where 
um, many molecules are uh, grown uh, at the same time and they grow from a surface like lawn growing from the ground up. Um, and uh, it's a series of chemical steps. Um, uh, so here, just to cover quickly, we add a base. Um, there's a, a process that strengthens the, the bond of that base. And then there's a process that allows the next base to um, to, to attach, which is the, 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 blocking, uh, the, the blocking step. And that cycle goes over and over, and that's what makes uh, the, the DNA molecules. Um, we don't grow one molecule at a time. We grow many, as I mentioned, and we grow many different sequences at a time using a method called the array, array synthesis. Um, and uh, essentially, we get multiple, we get the parallelism of growing multiple uh, sequences at a time. And that's what uh, gives us throughput. Um, next step is to preserve the DNA. So we'll uh, remove the molecules from uh, the substrate. Uh, we'll encapsulate, and this is work we've done in collaboration with ETH Zurich, uh, where the DNA is encapsulated, in this case, in uh, silicon dioxide uh, nanoparticles. And those are uh, stored into a DNA library, very much like we have uh, tape libraries um, today, except it's a lot smaller. Um, and then when it's time to recover the information, we do the random access using a combination of uh, 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 fluidics and really retrieving uh, the right library uh, with um, a random access used with PCR, which is that process that I mentioned that's copying the DNA. So we essentially can selectively copy the DNA based on that tag that we added, that file ID that we added in the beginning when we encoded the data. So uh, again, we can uh, only uh, copy uh, molecules that belong to the file that we uh, are interested in reading and not other files. So we copy those and then we sample from those and most of the molecules after we sample, um, after when we sample, after we do PCR, are the molecules that ultimately make it into a reader. Okay, so then the next step is to, to sequence it. So to read the DNA, uh, Illumina, who's gonna talk later today, um, has a sequencer that's based on uh, optic optical uh, uh, technology. And so essentially the idea is that you attach that complementary base uh, to a particular position in the DNA and then uh, do that successfully. And with that, uh, you can use uh, very uh, smart com computer vision tricks to, to essentially uh, detect which molecules are uh, in a particular space. Um, that generates a number of reads uh, that will then uh, later uh, decode into the sequences of bits that we originally uh, stored. Another way to do that is with uh, using nanopore devices. And so it, here the, the reading is electrical and, and it, it's really dragging the DNA through a nano uh, scale pore and uh, measuring electrical disturbances uh, that it causes as it goes through. And this, this is what generates the, the reads. Um, so there are errors in uh, both platforms. Uh, there's different types of, types of errors, not just substitutions, which would be the equ equivalent of a bit flip, but also insertions where uh, symbols appear and deletions where symbols disappear from our sequences. Um, but uh, we can still recover the information. And so we can use many uh, tricks from error correction and coding theory uh, to do that. So let me just quickly walk you through that. Um, so here are our sequences that we read. We reorder those sequences and cluster them uh, so that we uh, essentially group together sequences that are similar. Um, we perform a consensus, uh, the consensus analysis and come up with a sequence that's inferred to be uh, the sequence that, that came in originally. And then uh, we'll translate that into bits. If there's any sequences that are still missing, uh, uh, erasure errors, uh, then we're going to use that redundancy that we added in the beginning to recover from those. And uh, erasure, uh, that this, the, the code can also recover from a, a few additional errors if, if they trickle in. All right, and then we have all the sequences. We can use those sequence numbers to reorder them and then uh, to create uh, recreate the file that we had originally, um, originally stored. So going back to this pipeline here, I just wanted to be, to give you an overview of what's what's to come in the rest of this um, uh, the rest of the session um, for encoding and decoding. Uh, we're going to have Los Alamos um, 
uh, National Lab uh, talk about uh, their system. Uh, in synthesis, we're going to hear from uh, from from Twist on what they've been uh, when, uh, on synthesis and what they've been up to. Um, we're going to hear from Imogene on preservation um, and from uh, Denali on random access, and finally from Illumina on sequencing. So with that, I'm going to say bye, and uh, Luis will come back and and talk some more about uh, the trends and also some some more of our 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 collaboration and our work. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That's that's a tough act to follow, but I'll I'll try my best here. So I wanted to start with a few thoughts on you know just zooming out and seeing the progress that uh, DNA data storage has uh, has made as a field. And what this plot is showing is you know here in the x axis and the amount of data stored uh, in the y axis and um, you know the uh, diff different forms of of, of synthesis uh, to get there. And um, what's interesting first to note is that this is an exponential scale, so we are in exponential progress, which is great to see. Um, you know, so far lately we're roughly on the on the gigabyte uh, scale right now. You know, definitely uh, on array based array based synthesis. And you know, you're gonna hear more about this um, later today from from the Twist folks. So um, with that. I want to stop back and, and think about. Let's look at the trends here. You know, unfortunately, this stopped in 2015. You know, we should uh, get Rob Carlson to update this. Uh, but what this is, uh, this is known as the Moore's law of of DNA reading and writing. And a few things are of note here. Again, this is in an exponential scale, and the the red line is is synthesis. So synthesis has made some exponential progress, but then kind of slowed down. And I'm, I'm, I'm fully uh, confident that DNA data storage is going to push this back into you know a faster pace curve. And so the black line here is transistors per chip. So this is essentially Moore's law as a reference. And it's interesting to see that you know DNA's uh, uh, sequencing reading is is improving faster than than Moore's law at least for um, for a while. The point here is to show that you know this gives a lot of uh, confidence that this that DNA data storage is likely to be vi to be viable within a reasonable amount of time. And I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about uh, sequencing from from Craig later today. So. Um, but now, you know, thinking from a systems perspective, you know, what I just talked about was throughput. Now let's think about latency. You know, it turns out that latency uh, of synthesis and sequencing are typically done in batch and involves fluidics, involve physical actuation to a degree that's way beyond what we typically do in, in storage systems. So we're talking about latency. It's probably going to be out of tens of minutes to hours for um for synthesis and you know if we do uh, sequencing by synthesis but emerging technologies like nanopore that karen talked about since you get data real time you you're likely to push that uh that latency at least for the read outside you know closer to closer to real time so that's one trend the other thing that's interesting to think about on read and write mechanisms is looking at the trade-offs between you know what has been done for life sciences and what we need for uh for data storage you know the fundamental write and read mechanisms are uh, very similar, but actually the trade-offs um, are different. For example, you know, if you think about error rates in life sciences, uh, you know, single base uh, flipper mutation could lead to you know very significant effects. So, but with data storage, we can of course build error correcting schemes. We're going to hear a lot more about this, and it has been significant progress on that. And you know, you have uh, several error types. Um, and we can actually deal with that with a redundant information that uh, nature does that to some extent, but I would say not as robust as computer scientists have figured out. So one uh, ends up wondering, like, if we did have stronger correcting codes in nature, maybe we wouldn't have, you know, you know horrible diseases that we have today. Um, okay, now on the on the length. You know, so uh, for DNA data storage, and of course, uh, the the longer the, um, the the strand of DNA, the more data you put. But it turns out that you know there's a diminishing return, right? So after you um, after you amortize the overhead of of primer uh, sequences or other tags, or maybe an addressing scheme, you know those either stay constant or grow logarithmically with the payload. So after you know a few hundred bases or so, it's unlikely you're going to get significant benefit in terms of reducing overheads. Whereas, um, whereas in life sciences, longer sequences tend to have a lot more fun uh, function and you have really long genes. The reason, the reason that I mentioned this is that this uh, suggests a lot of optimizations to make the data storage uh, more uh, practical, right? You can trade off accuracy for lower cost and higher throughput. You can trade off sequence size for faster uh, writes and, and read. And, you know, this is, um, of course, uh, uh, a lot of folks working in this space are, are building on these, uh, these trade-offs. Now, all right, so we talk about these trade-offs. I mean, 
now discuss um, something that we're particularly passionate about is uh, the following question. When we succeed, and saying when, when we succeed in storing um, a lot of data in molecular form in DNA, this does beg the question of, you know, given that the benefit between the molecular world and the electronic world is likely to be limited, even with all the progress that we have ahead um, that, you know, I'm sure we're gonna get to, um, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually do a lot of computation in molecular form uh, directly, because then you you, uh, you you enable you know highly parallel efficient and energy efficient computing, and then also use a lot less bandwidth between the molecular world and the electronic world. Okay, so here's one example that uh, we're excited about. So you might have heard of DNA computing in the 80s. You know, there's a fantastic paper by Len Edelman um, in DNA One, the first DNA conference in 1994. They talked about solving an explanation time problem, Hamiltonian path problem. Um, with, uh, with DNA, and it worked in the following way. So uh, here you have a graph, and you want to find a way that actually a path that visits all of the nodes um, in a graph. So what a shortest path that would do that? Well, the way uh, you do that in DNA, you encode uh, each node here as a DNA sequence, and then edges are an overhang sequence that actually connects the two. So after I encode all nodes and all edges in a bunch of DNA molecules, I put them in a, in a solution, I shake them, right? Or I, I let them settle. And then when I look at the longest molecule that have formed, that shows us uh, what, the, um, what the result was. This is super cool. And it was an incredible idea that opened up, you know, a lot of possibilities in thinking about molecular computing. Uh, but the problem in this specific solution that it shifts the complexity from time to amount of material, right? So this is an exponential time problem. Um, now, if you were to do this in, in space, you're gonna need an exponential amount of space. So for you to solve any reasonable size problem here, you're gonna need you know, a, lot of, a lot of DNA, potentially even all of the atoms of the universe in form of DNA, which you know, is definitely not, uh, not practical. But what we've been thinking about is that what would DNA computing look like in the age of big data? So what we wanted here is essentially operate on data already stored in DNA. We wanna target polynomial time algorithms like search. Um, and uh, if we did that, we would uh, potentially have an extremely parallel and energy efficient way of, of manipulating information in a molecular form. The problem that we decided to explore is content-based image and video search for several reasons. First, you know, this is very bandwidth intensive uh, and it's uh, also a very uh, key primitive in uh, systems today. So content-based image and video search exists today and it's used in a variety of day-to-day uh, -day systems. You can do image-based uh, similarity search saying in Google or Bing. Um, and also this similarity search is a key primitive in machine learning systems um, that, you know, is part of a bigger, a bigger flow. Now, how would we do that in DNA? And the way this works is you give an image uh, to a database and you, and you retrieve images that are similar to your input image. In this case, they're airplanes. How do we do that in DNA? Well, um, we want to encode our database in DNA and be able to search it. So how do we do that? Well, first we need um, to start with an ob observation that's you know, fairly straightforward, especially in hindsight, that you know, as you know, DNA forms you know, this double helix. And if you have a complete match, this, bound, this bind, uh, binding between the two sides is very, very strong. But if you have a reasonably good partial match, you still uh, bind the two sides of, um, of your double helix. And you can have a poor match here that still binds, but it's a little bit um, less stable. So you probably get, can guess where I'm getting at here, but suppose that I had the following. Suppose that I had the database here on the, on the left encoded in a bunch of single cell DNA molecules. And then you have a query, something that I want to search for a match here attached to magnetic beads, okay? So now if I actually mix this, if I have a perfect match, there's a much higher, much higher likelihood that I'm going to retrieve the, the perfect match. Now, as I go with poor and poor matches, I decrease the probability and the frequency in which those, um, those resulting molecules will come out of the magnetic extraction process, right? So, okay, so how do we build on, uh, on that to do search? Here's how we do it. We um, came up with this idea of essentially um, encoding features the same features using computer vision, you know, where you extract visual, say in this case, is images. This is not constrained only to images. It could be video. It could be other forms of data. We're going to extract, you know, a feature vector from those data items. And then the question here is, how do we encode those data items, uh, this, uh, those uh, feature uh, data sets into DNA form such that you get the following property? So um, features that are similar, okay, so should have DNA sequences that are more likely 
to actually stick to each other, okay? Um, and the way we did that is via a um, learning process, okay? So we, um, and I'm gonna tell you more about it in a second, but keep that in mind that the property that we want here is that similar features leads to DNA sequences uh, that are more likely to stick to each other, okay? So proportionally to the similarity. Now, how would, would we build on that? Suppose that I have a, you know, a, a query uh, that looks like, like, sorry, a database looks like this, you know, I have the feature vector encoded in part of my DNA strand, and then I have a tag, and it just, just like an ID of the image in the rest of the strand. Okay, so now I have a query, say that, you know, that binocular I encoded in, in, in DNA using the same form here, using the encoder that we had talked about, and attached to the magnetic bead. So now I can build, if they are similar, you know, they're going to hybridize. So uh, the way we're going to build that into a database is encode all of your images into database trends, have a, you know, a large number of copies of your query attached to magnetic beads. I'm going to mix it all in a solution when everything, you know, gets stable, you know, be because it's the state of lowest energy, the, the most, the closest matches are the ones that are going to actually hybridize into the magnetic beads. So when I take that with the magnets, you know, if you take a picture, that's what it looks like. Now those are the magnets and the magnetic nanoparticles. And I take it out from the solution. And what I get back are things that look like the query image. So if you're into machine learning, you probably think that this is a form of semantic hashing, like the way we encode, say, a, a, sim, a feature in an Euclidean space and say in a, in a vector of floating point numbers, you can encode that into binary strings such that in Hamming space, uh, they have similar properties, uh, similar distance, right? So because in this case, it's cheaper to compute in a binary uh, representation than in floating point, for example. We kind of did a similar thing here, but into DNA. We, we think what we did is a translation from these feature vectors in Euclidean space into DNA sequences such that you have these properties that similarity in the Euclidean space leads to higher extraction and reaction yields in the DNA uh, in the DNA molecular space. Okay, so I don't spend too, too much time on this, but I'm happy to, you can read it on our paper, Nature Comes 2021. Um, basically, the way this works is starting with a set of images. We um, start um, with, you know, pairs. Uh, there are uh, of um, images whose features are mapped randomly into DNA. Then as I keep getting uh, these, um, these pairs of images, I run into the encoder, I measure their distance, I um, estimate the yield, and then I compare that, I estimate the, the yield with what the predictor said. If they don't agree, I keep mutating the encoding process such that for the training set, for all the similar images that are close enough, the, high, the estimated yield, um, of this extraction or the probability of sticking uh, is proportional, okay? Um, you can read more about the, the structure of the neural network that does that. The key thing I wanna point out here, that's the only reason I'm showing the structure here is that we definitely need um, a fully connected layer because we're gonna reduce the space that's much larger than we're gonna encode into DNA into a, to a relatively small set of, of bases. So we need to have a fully connected layer to actually spread and make use of the encoding space as well as possible. Um, and um, if, you're in, if you're interested in, uh, in the results, you should read, our, should read our paper. Basically what we did, we encoded 1.6 million images uh, in a database and synthesized uh, with, you know, with Twist services. Thank you, Twist. Um, they were collaborators with us on this, uh, on this project. This was uh, funded by, uh, by the DARPA Molecular Informatics Program. So thank you, Ann Fisher. Um, and this was a, like a result that got us really excited because when we actually ran the process and uh, took the images out and ran it through a sequencer, we got what we were expecting, which is molecules that had uh, the corresponding to corresponded to images that had low Euclidean distance or very similar are much more frequent than the ones that had high Euclidean distance. This was very encouraging, and we refined this as a lot more results, uh, a lot more results on the paper. So. Um, okay, so but now why am I excited about this as a computer architect? Um, the reason is because uh, I know there's a bunch of storage folks in this conference, so it's uh, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we are thinking about the storage device as a, as a 3D, you know, as a 3D shape, right? Typically capacity, is not typically, the capacity is function of the volume of this physical object, and the bandwidth is a function of the surface of the area. So that's why as you have a larger and larger storage uh, device, you tend to have much higher time to read it all, right? So the trends for uh, reading a whole hard drive is going up really fast. Today is on the order of, um, of days when it used to be in the order of, of hours, you know, not too long ago. 
That's because the capacity grows with the cube, the bandwidth grows with the surface of the area. So capacity grows L cubed and bandwidth grows L squared. Now, as, uh, as a computer architect, you know, you probably, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of near data processing. You probably heard of that before. The key idea there is to, you know, break down storage, say in this case happens to be, you know, a memory, solid state memory into little to smaller units and pair them with uh, processing elements. And the reason is because you have much higher bandwidth, they're smaller, they're closer, and you have lower volumes. You can actually have higher, um, much high, much lower time to read, read it all, right? You change the capacity to bandwidth ratio. That's a trend in computer architecture, ready right? to access data in high bandwidth and, and low latency. And the way I think about what we are doing here with this um, way of embedding computation in molecular form and diffusing through the data, is really that essentially, I, like one way of calling this is like diffusive computing. Right, you can store the data in a bunch of DNA molecules, and then you encode processing elements into molecular form, and then you let it diffuse through the data. And the reason this is cool is that since you're not um, attached to any specific physical organization of your um, of 3D physical organization of your data, you're not bound to a predefined surface to area, um, uh, surface to volume ratio. So you can choose and dial up your bandwidth depending on the needs of your application. No, this was a long argument, but I can't resist you know, making it because I do think it is a fundamental advantage that molecular storage would have over uh, traditional uh, data storage in be it in, in optical form, in electronic form, is that the fact that you can diffuse and rearrange it physically leads to really interesting systems properties that are likely to be useful. Um, okay, so now that was um, a form of a near molecule processing. And I wanna to transition to um, a different uh, a different point here, which is how we're going to package this all uh, this all of this into a system we can deploy, say in a data center, right? So one way to think about this, you know, neatly organized is having stations, a write station, a storage station, a read station in a rack scale, and that's the vision. And be able to encapsulate this in a way that you can actually put it in a put it in a data center. But the reality is that today we're doing a lot of this still like this, you know, this is an old photo by now, uh, but this is one of our grad students, uh, Lee Organic, who did a bunch of the work that we talked about today, and this is me pretending to be useful, it's all very manual. So there's a very big difference from uh, this and where we want to be in a fully automated system. So we've been thinking a lot about what would it take to automate the whole process from digital data, encoding to the molecules, storing them, retrieving and running to a sequencer. So we decided to build a system that, you know, the point is just to show automation, but not, um, not to be fast. You know, this was not fast at all, uh, but we built a synthesizer. You know, you see like the uh, um, phosphoramidides, A, C, Gs, and Ts. And, you know, there's a bunch of valves here that controls the, the, the synthesis process. We store it away and um, then we can retrieve it. Uh, prep it for sequencing and running through a nanopore sequencer here. So um, it was great to see that it's possible to show the, open our eyes of what's needed to be fully automated, uh, but that's still a long ways from um, this. This is a tape library uh, that's probably several years old already. It's still a long ways away. So the way we are thinking about bridging that gap is extending um, these, uh, the system with you know much more flexible way of manipulating you know samples and our our bet is that digital microfluidics is one of those because you you can rearrange and configure and program it uh, in a in in a flexible way and this technology has been around for some time we've been uh, building an open source one called Purple Drop um, and the way this works for those of you who don't know is the following so digital microfluidics has an array of electrodes. Uh, and has a conductive top plate here. And as you apply a voltage, you know, you the droplets move where the voltage is, okay? Um, here's some examples, uh, some, some videos. It is a droplet, a green droplet moving on, on our electrode board. And in order to control and see where things are, we've been applying computer vision to watch those droplets or using capacitive sensing uh, to monitor that just because it still, you know, needs uh, closed loop control. The reason I'm showing you this is that that's what we've been using to, uh, we've used to prototype what would be the equivalent of a, of a library on a card of DNA, right? So we, the uh, idea here is to store uh, DNA into pools that are dehydrated on the surface and then use droplets to retrieve uh, those spots of DNA. So in this top plate that I was talking about, you have spots of DNA uh, that dehydrates and when you want to retrieve it, 
a droplet visits there, stays there for a little bit, soaks up some DNA, and then we move it and uh, steer it to the, to the DNA sequencer. Uh, and we, um, we demonstrated that this, this works and it can work fairly well. There was a paper, Nature Comms paper a couple of years ago that you know, detailed how we did that and looked at contamination issues. We're looking at what are the chances of droplets leaving you know, molecules behind in a path and then later uh, contaminate other, other droplets that uh, cross the same path. And we didn't see any you know, very significant contamination. So this suggests a solution of you know, using uh, microfluidics as a you know, liquid robot to go pick data from a location and, and move it to another kind of similar to a robotic arm um, in, a, in a tape library. So um, we've been very excited about digital microfluidics in general. And we've been, um, you know, as part of this, we're building an affordable full stacks, uh, software and hardware digital microfluidics platform that you can express your, your protocols in Python and compile it down to the assembly code of controlling the, the actuation of um, electrodes on the board to move the droplets where they need to go and so on. Um, so um, this is far from being a, a professional large scale uh, solution, but we feel like these are ways of actually uh, de-risking and finding what are potential ways forward of building a data center scale fluidics manipulation systems. The, the price has to be lower. Uh, the, re the re reliability can be lower too, as long as there's enough redundancy. And we've been thinking about this, not just in the context of data storage and molecular computing, but also how do we scale this up to build truly, truly large scale um, automation for sample processing and other forms of, of, of molecular computing, of, of, of molecular manipulation. So zooming out, you know, the way we like thinking about, you know, DNA data storage and coupling it with a form of molecular computing, it's really having hardware, software, and wetware. Um, you know, we have, uh, and we have interfaces that are highly flexible, like for example, digital, micro, digital microfluidics to interface electronic domain with a molecular domain. Um, and we see this as a part of a, what could be a future hybrid system. You know, it's um, pretty clear by now that there's specialization in computer systems. We have CPUs, GPUs, accelerators um, done with electronics because it's ultra low latency, it's highly engineerable and allows you to control um, it perfectly. But um, we know that there's a lot of promise in other forms of computing using, for example, biomolecules that had self-assembly, massive data storage density, and uh, potentially very highly energy efficient computing mechanisms that are orders of magnitude lower than what electronics can be. And then of course there's quantum systems which massively parallel um, computing for problems like optimization, but you know, have typically have much lower um, IO uh, bandwidth in and out of a quantum system. And the reason I mention all of this is that I think there's an interesting world here uh, where you pick the best type of device technology for the best type of algorithms, right? And mix, uh, I don't think electronics and CMOS is ever gonna go away, but you know, um, we have to think about hybrid systems that makes the most out of each. So with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, we look forward to answering any questions you, um, you might have in the, in the online forums now. Thank you again for having us. And it's really great to see this, this field thriving and we can't wait to see where it's gonna be uh, in the near and uh, medium term future. So if you have more questions, you can also explore our website. Mm -hmm.